It's Dr. Sabrina Siegel here with a special series brought to you by the NEI Podcast. Welcome to the Psychopharmacology Show. In this special series, Dr. Andrew Cutler interviews Dr. Stephen Stahl on the most controversial, novel, and exciting topics in psychopharmacology today. Every three months, we will address a different theme in psychopharmacology. Each theme is split into three parts, with one part released each month. This next theme is on creativity and bipolar disorder. In this theme, we explore the research on creativity and mania, along with a look at the history of famous creative artists, writers, musicians, and inventors who are suspected of having bipolar disorder. Let's listen in to part one, the lightning in the storm, creativity and bipolar disorder. Welcome to another episode of the Psychopharmacology Show. It's a NEI podcast series. And today we've got a very interesting topic. We're going to be talking about the lightning in the storm, creativity in bipolar disorder. And with me, as always, is the inimitable Dr. Stephen Stahl. Steve, how are you? Great, Andy. Great to be here. Looking forward to discussing this topic. Me too. It's uh, something that I've been kind of thinking about for a long time. And let's just start out with the beginning. Is there really a link between bipolar disorder and creativity, or is that a myth? There's a link. It depends on what you mean by that. Is there basically one causes the other and it happens all the time? No. Mm -hmm. But there is a link, and any listener only has to think of their own practice and maybe have the experience of having highly creative, highly productive people with with bipolar disorder in their practice. So certainly at the anecdotal level, almost anybody Mm -hmm. who practices in mental health knows that there is a link. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, it's definitely something I've noticed in my practice, and there's been writings about this as well. But I think what you said is is interesting. There's not necessarily a bidirectional or an absolute relationship. I mean, not every patient I have with bipolar disorder is creative, for instance but many of them are. Right. It's more that if the brain is the source of both bipolar disorder and creativity, the genes that basically build that brain can have dual purposes or maybe a hundred purposes. And it seems that some of the genes that are building you towards bipolar disorder in the spectrum, one place or another, also build you in the direction of being creative. So there's an overlap between the genes. So the genes could have multiple purposes. And it is true that there is a genetic link both between bipolar disorder and creativity, as well as between the first degree relatives that are unaffected with bipolar disorder and their creativity. Hmm. I guess there's an old saying, uh, you, uh, you know, Dr. Akisko, who uh, was at UCSD sure. where I am at the end of his career. Yeah. And he was one of the most famous uh, psychiatrists championing uh, the spectrum of bipolar and, and even this issue about creativity. And he mm-hmm. used to say, it's not meant to be so good to have bipolar disorder of any degree of severity in order to be creative. But what you want to be is the brother of someone with bipolar disorder. <laughs> <laughs> so you get all the creativity genes and not too many of the bipolar ones. Well, that really is fascinating. So I'm thinking about throughout history of famous brothers (laughs) or sisters of people with bipolar. That's really interesting. You know, I've always speculated too, besides the neurobiology and shared genetics, that people with bipolar disorder feel things more deeply in a sense. They're more in touch in some ways with emotions and maybe the unconscious, and they they may just see things differently. Well, there's certainly the idea uh, that there's a cognitive difference. And of course, temperament is really one of the key words here. If you have a temperament where you are having a rosy disposition and you have energy and you also have a little bit of loose associations, in which case you're Mm -hmm. more likely to hold completely wildly unrelated things together. Often, of course, when we see that in psychiatry patients, it's, it's called psychosis. But some of the most brilliant insights in the world have been these sort of counterintuitive truths that came out from putting together things that were wildly unrelated. And that's done by a creative person with a 
cyclothymic, if you will, temperament. A little dose of bipolar, but not a high dose. Yeah, that's the problem is that it can render you uh, inactive or unable to create or be active. And that gets, gets me thinking about the difference in creativity, or maybe it's productivity between when someone's manic and when they're depressed. There have been a number of poets, of course, who have mostly been morose and on the depressed side without too much up on the bipolar side. And it has been said that at least uh, there's been limited, if any, great American poets who weren't alcoholics. Now, <laughs> Whether they were also self-medicating, depression, bipolar, or otherwise, we don't know. But it's more the up pole, which, of course, is the one that we're really associating with the creativity. And the one thing to remember is that old saying, the dose is what makes it a poison. Mm. So if you have too much of a dose of this bipolar gene, it's a poison. It, it makes you not productive. So there's a sweet spot between just enough and too much. So I guess the goal is to be hypomanic. If you get too manic and psychotic, you, you obviously aren't very productive either. Well, who listening to this as a mental health professional has not seen patients with bipolar that want to run a little high? Yeah. And uh, they all, you know, they don't want to be normal down there with the, you know, the rest of us bums that are, you know, youth thyvic. That's no fun. But the problem is it's not possible necessarily to see on a 10-point scale with 10 meaning being psychotic mania and zero being normal to run at about a three or a four. It's just not a stable state. It doesn't stay there very long. It usually either crashes into depression or it flips into mania. But our patients will often screw around with their medicines, won't they, trying to get to that state because most people who are bipolar have had, you know, periods of time on the scale all the way up. And the resting place on that plus three or four on that 10-point scale is where we all would like to be. Oh, sure. I always say, who wouldn't want to have more energy and lots of creative ideas and think you're the smartest, best-looking person in the room, you know? <laughs> well, in your Whether case, energy is true. I mean, the rest yeah, of well. us have to be a little <laughs> manic about yeah. ourselves. Yes. Well, he also reminded me of something a, a very influential professor of mine once used to say. He, he said, never envy a manic. And of course, because sometimes, especially in the hypomania, you sort of go, go wow, this is you know, great. I envy that. But he said, you know, the flip side is always crushing depression or psychosis, I guess. Right. What? Well, one of the traits you're talking about that would be positive before you do that is they call it openness. And openness reflects dimensions of imagination, fantasy, not psychosis, not hallucinations, just fantasy, a sensitivity to beauty and aesthetics, attentive to your own inner feelings. I mean, all of us have them, but not all of us are attentive to that. A mm -hmm. preference for variety. And, and a, basically something that's interesting is a heightened curiosity. So these mm -hmm. are all traits of people on that route towards being bipolar manic. But we don't want to say being a mad genius, to what extent that's an overused and really distorted phrase. That's not what you want. You don't want to be a mad genius. There maybe is no such thing as a truly mad genius. You want to be, you know, a bit of it. Right. Well, that really gets me thinking of what I said about earlier, you know, this idea that they're more in touch with their emotions and, and maybe it's this openness you're talking about. That really makes a lot of sense. Also, you know, you got me thinking of something biologically. I mean, there, it has been shown that there's an overactivity of the default mode network in people with mood disorders. And that's kind of what you're talking about, this self-referential, internal, preoccupied with your own thoughts kind of thing. Well, so if you're we're... creative, but you're lazy, what good is that going to do you? Mm -hmm. And the idea is that if you also have the energy with your creativity, then the, the bipolar spectrum traits, short of, you know, basically disabling mania, are increased sociability, strong ambition, drive to succeed and, you know, a desire for recognition by others to say how great you are. And uh, they characterize those who excel because of their creative talents. And of course, they, they can be observed in anyone. But if you look at business people, you look at, mm -hmm. you know, people in uh, other areas, basically, I, you know, everybody have heard of the, the name Michael Jordan, right? Mm -hmm. Well, Michael Jordan, of course, was one of the most talented basketball players, if not the most in the world. But he also work as hard as anybody. So you can imagine a talented person who works his, his tail off. And I don't think he actually has a mood disorder. He's just an example of maybe a 
a highly talented person who had drive. So you can have drive without being bipolar, but mm-hmm. it is a little bit of, of a self, self-propelling fuel if you have bipolar with your creativity. Yeah. Well, also, it helps to have a little bit of bad judgment, if you think, or not such good self-awareness. I mean, it's a little bit strange to think that you're going to be the most successful or famous and defy all the odds here. So you have to have almost an irrational uh, sense of self. Right. And you can come across those all throughout history. Uh, we have a book, yeah. we'll discuss it in another one of these pods on on uh, Nikola Tesla, who mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. brought completely wild ideas that were thought to be com- almost psychotic, they were so crazy, together and made, you know, inventions that have changed the world. Mm-hmm. So it is possible to do that. And, and you need to kind of have some, I suppose, either narcissism isn't really the word. I mean, these people are not really narcissistic. They're just confident. Um, yes, yes. And, and self-absorbed at times. Yeah. Yeah. So l- let's come back to something that there have there has been research done on this, obviously. And what patients self-report, what do patients say about their mood disorder and creativity? How do they say that they interact? Well, first, um, it depends on how creative they are. But when you do have, you know, we're, we're talking about people who generally have a, a quite above average IQ mm-hmm. and quite above average accomplishments. Because it can be, you think it's hard to define in DSM bipolar disorder, try defining creativity. So that's a hard one. I mean, some of it, people are so creative that it's self-evident, but those people, you know, they, they uh, have an association with their creativity that is linked to bipolar disorder. So there's two associations really. Bipolar has a genetic link. Creativity has a genetic link. And some of the same factors that cause one cause the other. And even more than that, bipolar first degree relatives that they don't have bipolar have the link to creativity in families. Finally, there's a link of intelligence in families. So, you know, it depends on which genes you get and if, and basically again, what dose of the genes you get. So you want to maybe a little bit of bipolar temperament, but you don't want to really have mania. Yeah. I've also heard it said that there's an association between genius and bipolar. And I suppose that creativity and genius overlap quite a bit, don't they? Right. And, you know, if you're schizoid and you live in a closet and don't do anything with your creativity or you're lazy, um, you know, you can ruin your creati- or your genius, if you will. And an example of that might uh, be another book I'm working on right now, which has to do with Jackson Pollock. He's well, a guy who's going to him up. Yeah. He's a quite young guy, quite a genius, and, and uh, mm-hmm. drank himself to death and killed himself uh, you know, in a drunk driving uh, incident. So, you know, in some ways, yeah, he uh, wasted his life because uh, he, he could have had much more output. Yeah, but what an incredible artist and how influential he was. Absolutely. So that's genius. And, uh, you know, the issue is, does that occur during your bipolar phases, or does it occur when you're euthymic between your bipolar phases? It's not really known from the research, but it is true that it, you can do in a number of people who have ways to track their productivity, that their productivity occurs during hypomanic times. I, I, I can remember the time I was able to see the original score of Handel, who mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. wrote The Messiah, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And... If you look at the original score, in those days they had ink and pen, right? You could see the ink flying off the page. I think he wrote it in 20 days. This is wow. 53 movements and so forth. It's one of the longest, uh, you know, uh, complete sets of, of composition ever made. And he did it in a very short period of time. He clearly was at least hypomanic. He probably wasn't too manic. But you have decreased need for sleep. You have a sharp focus. You feel eutho- euphoric, if not at least euthymic. And, you know, then you go. So it it sounds like that's the time when they're most productive, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's the time when they're having their creative ideas. I've worked with a couple of patients who tell me during the depressed phase, as long as they're not too depressed, sometimes they get some insights and ideas, but they can't necessarily act on them until they flip out of it. Yeah. And particularly artists that want to talk about those types of feelings, they can't write about them until they're in the state where they have them. And we've all seen patients, again, speaking to the mental health practitioners that may be listening, if you take a history of a person when he's depressed, 
and you take a history of that same person when he's not, you don't get the same history. And so the people see things uh, in a different way, you could say distorted, when they have a, a mood. And then when they come out of it, they don't see it that way. So you can imagine a writer who's trying to talk about grief or trying to talk about pain, agony, you know, disappointment. It's better to do that when you're depressed than when you come out of it because uh, you just don't have the same, you know, touch with those feelings. So some, many artists then would do or they would drink, you know, and then and feel it's clear that maybe Pollock, for example, we talked about him, was mm -hmm. mostly painting either when he was intoxicated or while he was withdrawing from alcohol. Well, the one that comes to my mind is, is William Styron, who wrote Sophie's Choice. He wrote a terrific book called Darkness Visible that was about his experience with depression. And it's just an incredible counting of that. And he, of course, ultimately probably had bipolar disorder and also suffered from a alcohol use disorder. But you're right, I, reading, because I've read that book and Boy, it's really intense, <laughs> the description. I've only read, read excerpts of it. I should read the whole thing, but I agree with you. It's quite yeah, highly, highly recommend it. And I, I actually talked to a, a psychiatrist, believe it or not, who was involved in his care at one point and said that Styron only acknowledged the depression and would not acknowledge the bipolarity, but he said it was quite obvious to us on the treatment team that he was bipolar. So. Who, who doesn't want to be bipolar at least a little bit? So, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. people uh, mm. want to deny that. Yeah. Well, there is a stigma, of course, to, to all this. I'm curious, though, is there actually a higher rate of bipolar disorder amongst artists and creative people? Do we know anything about that? Well, there have been many studies of that. And, of course, it's hard to, to define what, you know, an artist is. You know, our friend Nancy Andreasen, who's a famous psychiatrist mm -hmm. from Iowa, yeah. Well, there's a tremendously famous uh, writer's workshop. Actually, she was the editor of the American Journal of Psychiatry, did a lot of um, stuff in schizophrenia. She's still alive, but retired. Yes, but she right. wrote up a, a study of 30 creative writers and 30 match controls, and 80% of the writers had a mood disorder. Wow. The rate of bipolar yeah. was 43%. It was four wow. times more than normal. And the milder form of bipolar was more prevalent than the severest form. So there is a, there's a, Kay Jameson, we, it's written mm -hmm. many famous books and herself is known for having her own bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. She says that, I guess she studied about 50 British 18th century writers and 38% mm -hmm. of them were had a mood disorder that they were treated for mm -hmm. and so forth and so on. So there have been these yeah. kinds of studies yeah. out there. But one That's interesting right. thing I saw in a note when I was re reviewing this for our talk today, you know, Somebody else did a study at the same time they were looking at these writers. You know who doesn't have an increased incidence of bipolar disorder? No. Accountants and actuaries. <laughs> that does not surprise me at all, Steve. <laughs> that was kind of funny. Does not surprise me. Yeah, Kay Redfield Jameson, who, of course, a very famous psychologist who herself has bipolar um, she wrote a, a book called Touch with Fire that chronicled many famous people, famous creative people throughout history who actually have bipolar disorder. And, you know, fun fact, Steve, I don't know if you know this, but Nancy Andreasen's PhD is not in something science related. It's actually in English literature. Um, I remember hearing that, yes. Yeah. And as you mentioned, you know, the, a very famous, uh, one of my best friends from college is actually a New York Times uh, bestselling author. And he used to attend the Iowa Writers Workshop every summer. And she, uh, being at the University of Iowa, is, was very involved with that as well. So that's an interesting connection. Uh, you know, we talk about creativity sometimes in a traditional sense. And actually, before I say that, Steve, one of the clues that I use for bipolarity is actually creativity. And I will sometimes ask, very often, as a matter of fact, I'll ask a depressed patient, are you creative in some way? And mm. it's amazing what you get out of that. Sometimes they look at you funny and they're sort of deciding, should I tell them or not? <laughs> and right. then something interesting comes out. So that can be a clue. But, you know, it, it, it's interesting to me that people can be creative in traditional ways, like we're talking about artists, musicians and whatnot. But there's also non-traditional ways. For instance, many famous entrepreneurs have been creative. You can be creative out of the box thinker in business, right? Well, it's uh, Ted Turner was a famous exactly. bipolar, is one, I guess, yes, uh, yes, had a yes. permi up and down course. There's a lot of speculation about the good old Elon Musk. Yes. He you know, kind of alluded to that in some of his uh, tweets over the years that he has a, a, a bit of bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. Clearly a genius. But you can be a business mm -hmm. genius as well. You're right. Creativity comes in many forms. Exactly. And, and that's what I find so interesting. Mm -hmm.
Keeping up with the latest in psychiatry shouldn't be a struggle. SynovianFieldMedical.com is a new website for clinicians where you can find a library of free, hand-selected resources, such as videos and infographics on important psychiatry topics. You can request an educational program for your practice or connect with Synovian medical professionals in your area. Synovian wants to help you get all of your psychiatry questions answered. Go to synovianfieldmedical.com and explore what Synovian has to offer. You know, as you mentioned, a lot of these out-of-the-box thinkers, I want to get back to Tesla for a second, because this is one of the greatest inventors of all time, but clearly had bipolar disorder. And what do we know about his mood states and when he was creative, uh, periods of his life? I know you're working on a book about him, and you're going to speak at the APA about him. Well, we know that he wasn't psychotic very much. He was uh, psychotic, in, in funny enough, as a child, where he would actually have these... or near pre-psychotic experiences where he would, you know, hear fire 40 miles away and, uh, you know, and these sorts of things. And so he had some visual and auditory distortions and hallucinations and, and uh, unusual thinking, but he mostly was hypomanic. And mm-hmm. so he would uh, write his patents when he was hypomanic. And to look at the time I've mapped out the times when he was was hypomatic and when he had his patents they correlate and you can say how did I do that and the answer is he never saw a psychiatrist but most of what we know about him is from his own hand he wrote quite a bit about himself he wrote about periods of time when he was in bed and they thought he was dying of something mm-hmm. and uh, they didn't know what it was and physicians couldn't treat him and then all of a sudden he get better well that was called a major depressive episode <laughs> right. He did have a manic episode in college when he was eating, drinking, gambling, and womanizing. But mostly it was just a type of hypomania, which was sometimes charismatic. I mean, Mm -hmm. sometimes Mm -hmm. what's really interesting is that it's fun to be around a hypomanic patient. It's almost infectious if you've been around. And it's funny and it's laughter. And the same thing is it's kind of like depression's infectious as well. So he was this showman and he had a lot of charisma and during his up periods, he could raise funds and he could uh, convince people. And when he lost that during episodes later in life, when he was more neutral, or he spent a lot of the last of his years in a bipolar depression state, he was more morose and, uh, you know, irritable and uh, certainly not charismatic. And people didn't, you know, weren't convinced of his new crazy ideas and he he couldn't (laughs) raise funds. Mm Mm-hmm. Fascinating. That's really fascinating. There are other very famous people, obviously, who've got bipolar disorder. And I, I you know, you've just got me thinking about Tesla here and being able to raise money. I, I actually treated a patient several years ago, a gentleman who was a very successful entrepreneur, but he made and lost three fortunes in his lifetime. And it's like you were saying, he would make the money on the hypomanic on the way up and then he became depressed and he would lose it. And lost all the money. And it actually happened three times in his life. Quite impressive big fortunes. Yeah. And that's happening. That's, I'm sure that's happening out there all the time. There are some famous writers and poets. And I'm going to quote a couple here. Well, I'll mention a couple. William Blake, Victor Hugo, Edgar Allan Poe, and Walt Whitman. What do we know about them in bipolar? Do we believe they had bipolar? Well, mostly they're famous for their depressive episodes in which, you know, they're the themes of their writings were much more like that, usually. Um, and so certainly F. Scott Fitzgerald was in the Roaring Twenties. I guess we're in the new Roaring Twenties right now, the 21st century <laughs> Roaring Twenties. And, um, and he was in the 20th century Roaring Twenties. And uh, that was an up phase. And also a lot of these people were drinking, as you know, self-medicating right. or whatever. So it, same thing with uh, Pollock. It's very difficult sometimes to separate the mood disorder from the alcoholism and whether yes. the alcoholism is a treatment for the mood so you feel yes. better or actually it causes the mood disorder because it's so right. depressing. Right. So all these writers seem to have uh, a lot of their uh, writing. They couldn't write, of course, when they were massively intoxicated or, you know, paralytically depressed. But a lot of them had, you know, lingering depression and pop quiz. When was the first antidepressants, you know, brought to the market in the 1960s, right? So anybody who was uh, creative before the 60s got no treatment. 
Right. Right. Well, the uh, antidepressant effects of amphetamines were kind of known in the 30s and 40s. And I'll bet a lot of these, some of these people probably abused amphetamines. Oh, that I'm is thinking. a really good point. Yeah. And so, yeah, to self -medicate, self -medicate. They were called, no, they're called bennies, that's remember? Right. Bennies, that's right. Speaking this of was the DL amphetamine. And um, of course, used right. by the Germans during World War II to prevent fatigue in their soldiers. And Hitler himself actually was a benzodrine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like they gave it to their pilots as well. It's interesting because you know some of the most creative and best psychopharmacologists I've ever seen are bi patients with bipolar disorder. They're amateur psychopharmacologists, <laughs> and ah. you know they really are good at using <laughs> stimulants in the depressed phase and things to calm them down when they're getting manic. It's really amazing. Nope. Well, if they're sophisticated, uh, but you know some people have the mistaken idea that they can't be creative without being uh, manic. Yes, that's right. and uh, <clears throat> and. They either try to be manic because they don't really get it, or they reduce their medicines to try to find that sweet spot on that plus three or four right. on that point curve. Uh, yes. And we see that all the time. People want to yeah. be a little bit manic. They're afraid that they're they're not who they are unless they're a little manic. They're afraid they can't be, that their creativity is suppressed when they're normal. And there may be a little bit of uh, truth to that at the lower end of the mania scale, but certainly, I mean, if you're psychotic and uh, jumping out of windows, yeah. and you know, that's not going to be very great. Well, that was certainly the knock on lithium in particular. Lithium really cognitively can impair and dampen that creativity. But I'm not so sure it's true with uh, some of our newer medicines, the atypical antipsychotics. What do you think? Well, particularly at lower doses, these yeah. ages... You know, it's been very difficult to treat the depressed phase of bipolar disorder. And we've only really kind of awakened to the fact that many of the patients that we've seen in the past and called unipolar depression have just been undiagnosed or misdiagnosed forms of bipolar illness. Mm -hmm. You know, there there is a such thing as unipolar depression, so I'm not saying it's all yes, bipolar. Right. right. But, uh, it, in the old days, it was maybe 2% of, of, of the population had some sort of a bipolar spectrum and 98% of, of depressed patients were unipolar. It's uh, funny, but it might be closer to 50-50, particularly if yeah. you use mixed states where people have the simultaneous so, presence of uh, bipolar up and bipolar down. Yeah. Yeah, of course, you mentioned Hague up a Kiskel earlier, and I think of Jules Angst, and both of them were big proponents of the bipolar spectrum. And I know I've heard you say many times, there's not just bipolar 1 and bipolar 2, there's bipolar 9 and 10. Patient came in, and I don't know what was happening. I guess I was sitting in on him supervising, and she came in, and she had on a red scarf with a flower in her hair. And he says, you need to go no further that this is a form of bipolar. We don't know what went in it. And uh, he said, I probably, she probably drove here in a convertible with a top down. So um, <laughs> I don't know if I have bipolar 72 or something. But, <laughs> right. um, you know, I guess it gets to the point that, do you know that all this creativity talk and all this bipolar talk is mediated by genes, but each gene has a tiny influence. So it takes a whole bucket of genes to give you any mental disorder, it turns out. For example, each gene may only account for like a percent or less of the risk for that disorder. So obviously, before you get the disorder, you have 100%, right? So you're putting together, you know, if not dozens, hundreds of genes. And if you have the whole bucket of hundreds of genes, then you're bipolar one and you have a lot of disorganized uh, problems. But maybe if you only get 50 of the genes or 30 of the genes and so forth, mm -hmm. you end up having lower degrees of that. And maybe if you're lucky, there's some of those, say, 200 genes, you want to call it that, for bipolar disorder. Maybe 50 of those are also creative genes. So if you mm -hmm. only get those 50 and you don't get the other 150, you might have a lot of creativity with only a bipolar temperament. Mm -hmm. That would be great. <laughs> that would be ideal. You know, this makes me realize also this is why uh, genetic testing has been so elusive uh, because it, 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 the genetics are so complicated of the brain. Right. Well, there's how many forms of bipolar are there? I mean, sometimes yeah, I tell my I patients if the patient's name is Sally Jones, I say, you have the Sally Jones syndrome. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you don't exactly. necessarily have a diagnosis under the DSM. It's your own unique exactly. constellation of the disorder put together your way. Because everybody has their own, I mean, if you look at these, look, we have 10,000 genes and each gene can make many gene products. 
So if you literally need hundreds of them to put together for a mental disorder, there are many ways you can be bipolar and the gene underlying them are in no ways identical one patient to the next. Yes. So it's really not bipolar disorder. It's the bipolar disorders, <laughs> actually. Exactly. And, and fact. this is one of the things, as you know, I've been doing research on new medications for 30 years. And this is one of the things that's, that's really dogged us is that we're having a hard time matching the mechanism of action of the drug to the biologic substrate. We don't have good biomarkers like they do no. in other fields of medicine. And so, you know, the phenotype, if you want to call it that, or the diagnosis, is a very poor way to try to predict which drug is going to work. Because yes. obviously, if you have a phenotype, we call it, talking about bipolar disorder, although, although most drugs with antipsychotic actions will work for mania, who knows which drug is going to work for your depression. It's more exactly. through trial of error. The genes don't help us yet. Yeah. No, that's an interesting point you bring up, too. It ain't hard to treat mania, it seems like. You know, any antipsychotic works, lithium works, uh, divalproix works. So it's not hard to treat mania. It's depression that's the, the real challenge, isn't it? Pretty much. There are some very brittle people with mania. Yeah, There's some very true. weird situations where, <clears throat> I don't know if you've come across it, where people are lithium responsive and they're really not responsive to anything else. And mm -hmm. I've had the sad situation, I suppose some of our listeners here who treat this or some patients listening may think, all of a sudden you have renal problems, you can't keep on your lithium, then those disorders get very difficult to treat in my hands and sometimes you can't do it. So what is it about the genetic yes. constellation of that person that actually mandated lithium? There are such things, but we don't know why. You know, it's interesting we've had lithium all this time and we still don't fully understand how it works and we haven't been able to come up with a safer version. It's kind of like clozapine. We haven't come up with a safer version of clozapine. Yep, it's one of a kind. I'll give a little plug here. You know, Jonathan Meyer, a good friend of ours and listeners yes. will know him from uh, le lectures we've given together. Well, we're writing a book on lithium because we're afraid that uh, it's a lost art. So nothing like lithium. Oh, I agree. It's one of my kind of secret weapons, I guess, when I'm treating these people. You know, I'm curious about why bipolar disorder has existed all this time. It's highly hereditary, but yet, and it's still prevalent in the population. What purpose does it serve? Does it help our society in some way? Well, some people think it's maybe the price we have to pay uh, for creativity. Mm -hmm. In other words, since the genes are mixed in with bipolar disorder, that you got rid of bipolar disorder, maybe you'd get rid of a whole lot of creativity. And so until... You know, the genetic selection is such that I guess we need the brothers and sisters of the bipolar patients <laughs> in our world, and then we need to have good mercy to take care of, of, of the more severely affected bipolars. But it's, it is part of, of being a human being. I mean, we all have temperaments. We all have, you know, our own points of view, our own intelligence, our own creativity at whatever level. And uh, the highest levels of these associated with bipolar temperaments or even bipolar disorder. That's a really interesting point, Steve, that we're talking about exaggerations, if you will, of normal emotions. We all have mood swings and, you know, we need to have these emotions, but it, it's when they become too extreme and cause problems or you can't shut it off. You know, it, it's one thing to have reactive mood to a situation, but what if your mood is depressed all the time, you know, for weeks and months at a time? That's obviously not adaptive. You know, I'm wondering too about, could, could there be something about, something you said about Tesla, you know, Tesla was, when he was hypomanic, was quite charming and, and attracted people to him. Well, could it be that bipolar patients have a good chance of reproducing because they become attractive and seductive and they can reproduce when they're younger and then the wheels can fall off later, but who cares? You've already reproduced and passed your genes on. Yep. And I think it's a know, good point. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering, just wondering about this and maybe, you know, it's beneficial to society to have, I don't know, five, 10 percent of us being uh, out-of-the-box thinkers and creative and all of these kinds of things. You just can't have a whole society like that, obviously. Yeah, and, and again, some of this is more about artistic and some of it's more scientific or, if you will, business. Mm -hmm. And so the artistic part is more about quality of life and uh, the sp special parts of existence which make you a human. That's fascinating. Something you, you said earlier that when you were talking about artists who, artists and composers who were often 
being creative at times when they were intoxicated and using substances. I, I'm, I'm reminded of Vincent van Gogh, who was clearly bipolar, and he loved his absinthe. And, you know, apparently there was a period, absinthe apparently changes your color perception, I guess it is. And there was that period when everything was orange and yellow that he was doing. And people think right. that's when he was intoxicated with absinthe. So it's very interesting the effect these things can have. Well, the one thing that we're finding out, like, for example, with Jackson Pollock, although it looks like these are random uh, squiggles and so forth of thrown paints, there are actually embedded images in there, if you look carefully, like elephants wow. and uh, clowns and things like that. I didn't and know it, that. It's thought that maybe what happens when you throw paint, I mean, it's like looking at the clouds or any blob, you can see, you know, Mickey Mouse mm -hmm. in a blob of paint and, you know, sure. and then see that yeah, it's, a Rorsch, it's a Rorschach test, right? Rorschach, and then he could maybe shape it a little bit to make it look, look the original blob was a blob. Oh, mm -hmm. I see Mickey Mouse in that. So then he shapes it a little bit to make it even more look like Mickey Mouse. So it's mm -hmm. both accidental and on purpose. But those mm -hmm. visual perceptual distortions as a part of me and also a part of alcoholic hallucinosis may actually combined with genius, put all that in a, you know, in, in a cup and mix it all up and you have Jackson Pollock's. I'm curious, you know, we're talking about <clears throat> these people throughout history. How do you think people with bipolar disorder have been seen or viewed or even treated by society historically? Well, the severe ones are just lumped in with schizophrenia and considered. Yeah. And of course, that's true. If you look in our state hospitals or, or some of our forensic facilities where the most severe forms of bipolar disorder are tantamount to a, you know, a natural history, tracking that of serious mental illness, schizoaffective, et cetera. But I think in general, some people who were just odd and could function were curious and uh, not only tolerated, but possibly celebrated. But the ones that had m moderates, I mean, in the old days, families took care of mental illness. And yeah. so weird Uncle Joe maybe couldn't work, but, you know, he told good stories or basically wrote or whatever he did until he went off the deep end and, uh, you know, drank too much or whatever. Um and so families would take them back and take them back and take them back. So they were really supported in families. And then, of course, some were highly successful, like you say, they so made and lost three fortunes. So during that time, they're, they're self-sufficient and independent. Well, speaking of which, you, you mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, Ted Turner of CNN. His father apparently was bipolar as well, although uh, probably fairly high functioning. But I'm reminded of the story a few years ago. I don't know if you remember this episode, Steve, but... He actually, he was taking lithium. He went off his lithium and he was either hypomanic or fully manic. He pledged one billion with a B dollars to solve world peace. And of course, the next day, his handlers quickly pulled it back <laughs> and he got back on his medicine. But I always found that to be a fascinating story. Well, it wasn't enough. <laughs> yeah, probably not enough, right? Well, no, it's grandiose, but it wasn't enough. Certainly enough. grandiose, but uh, you know... No, uh, the noble sort of delusion, I guess. Exactly. Yeah, you know, we talked a little bit about lithium. I, I'm just curious again if we can talk a little more about does treatment dampen or interfere with creativity, or does it keep somebody from becoming psychotic manic and allow them to be in a zone where they can be productive? What do you think about that? I think the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, I do too. Oh. And so, I mean, there there are clearly people that, but for the treatment would be disabled by their bipolar and that it's not funny to let them yes. have their bipolar run rampant. On the other hand, I mean, nothing's worse than being cognitively blunted if you're creative. Yes. And so these medicines can do that. And so well, I not, like what you said earlier, I think is really true. And I, I quote you all the time, your famous D, which is different drug, different dose. And so it could be with the atypicals, if we overdo it, we are going to dampen them. We're blocking right. too much D2, and with lower doses, we are helping the person. And I sometimes, you know, try to get a truce with the patient instead of fighting with them and try to come to some sort of a, a, an agreement that maybe they could run a little bit higher than would be textbook ideal. But mm -hmm. if you can find a, a somewhat stable situation where they're not sedated, you know, they, otherwise they're not going to take their medicines at all. So you have to, yeah. have to deal with what is the possible, not what's the ideal. Yeah, and I've certainly run patients' lithium levels in the 0.4 range and, you know, in an attempt to do that, just find the sweet spot. 
Yeah, everybody has kind of like their own ability to tolerate things and that you can keep on looking until you find something. Some of these newer drugs, some of the new atypicals um, have very low side effect burden at low doses. So that's uh, lithium has its problems, valproate has its problems. And there's no, lithium doesn't work and you need a lithium, there's no other lithium. That's the problem. There's nothing (laughs) else. That's right. That's right. There's no other lithium. Yeah, you know, I think these newer typical antipsychotics, certainly the tolerability and safety has been improved. With cariprazine, you know, there's the possibility that you're helping cognition as well. And it's interesting that there have been studies looking at adding stimulants to atypical antipsychotics or mood stabilizers. And not only do patients not get worse, they actually function better in some ways and can improve their cognition. Well, some do for sure. I mean, there is is a possibility of, particularly in schizophrenia, of making psychosis worse. But Mm -hmm. we in the state hospitals will sometimes take patients, have some cognitive blunting Mm -hmm. as the price of getting under control and give them modafinil as another possibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like you say, cariprazine has some studies that it actually improves negative symptoms in schizophrenia and may have some procognitive actions. The newest one, lumetepirone, actually Mm -hmm. is... Uh, very well tolerated. It's got, you know, very low side effect burden. And so, you know, it's different strokes for different folks. And that's why it's good to know all of them and be able to rotate through them until you find the the best match. Yeah, it's interesting. You're you're mentioning lumetepron makes me think about bipolar one and bipolar two, because it, like quetiapine, is approved for both bipolar one and bipolar two. Do you think there's a difference in what we're talking about here, this creativity association between bipolar one and bipolar two? Probably. Yeah, I think that this is more even in people who are even bipolar twos. So if you look mm-hmm. at the one step below that, it'd be sort of a cyclothymic temperament mm-hmm. 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 or you, you run high, you have a rosy disposition, you're optimistic, you don't need as much sleep, you have a lot of energy, but mm-hmm. um, not enough to be hypomanic. Mm-hmm. And so that's probably, you know, arguably the ideal state. And uh, bipolar one probably is too much dose. Yeah, so maybe there's a gradient here of creativity, if you will. Right. It goes along with the gradient of the illness. Well, I want to sort of wrap up here by asking a couple of other theoretical questions, okay? We've talked a lot about research and what's known, but I'm wondering, what can, what can we learn by understanding more about creativity in patients with bipolar? How could that help us, potentially? I think what it can tell us is that there are aspects of that individual which are complicated and that may need to be addressed so that they can be expressed. And so, you know, just whacking people down into, you know, complete normal mood might seem like a laudable thing to do, particularly if someone's had a horrible, ex, you know, incident of, of very high mood. But it's it's probably okay to be thinking about how what's balanced and what's the ability and also what's sustainable. You know, if you have someone right after a crisis, right after hospitalization, they'll be compliant. But, you know, do you really have compliance if you stifle all creativity? I don't think so. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that we talk a lot about the negatives of mental illness. And certainly we're trained to look at the negatives when we look at the symptoms and we look at the impairment. But I think also we need to understand the benefits, the positives, and help patients find and celebrate those, the, the strengths, the talents they have, if you will, so they don't feel so beaten down. You know what I tell patients sometimes in that same vein that you're saying, you know, to, to celebrate, you know, that I guess the, I, I, I think it's Benjamin Franklin said this. I think I've told you this before. Nothing in excess, including moderation. <laughs> <laughs> the idea is that if you, yeah. you know, if you get, I'll go along with you. Yeah, let's have you have a little bit of sociability, uh, more ambition, get your drive mm-hmm. to excel coming back. Let's get your or mojo back, what do you want to call it? But, you know, it's not endless. And so, you you know, don't overdose on that. So, you know, keeping a, a lid on it is maybe more reasonable than saying, let's abolish it. So th- that's the idea is that you can ride high a little bit as long as it's, uh, you have your judgment and uh, it's not dangerous, but, you know, let's not go too high. Well, Steve, there are those who would say that you are chronically hypomanic with how productive you are and how creative your thinking has been. So maybe we can all aspire to be a little more like Stephen Stahl. 
I don't know about that. I've been accused of saying my lithium level is too low, even though I'm not in, on any. But, um, <laughs> on, yeah. but that's uh, an interesting point of view. You know, it's, it is yeah. true that having a drive and mm -hmm. being sort of really enamored with your work is self-perpetuating. And the drive to succeed is something that does not have to necessarily uh, be part of a bipolar illness, but maybe is some of the genes of, of an unaffected person. Certainly true. And, and that brings up, you know, we talked about the spectrum and the, the overlap. And, you know, it's, it is very interesting. When do you draw the line and actually give somebody a label and make the diagnosis? And when is it just sort of the boundaries of normal human experience? And I suppose that's a, a topic we could approach on an, another one of these episodes. Okay, let's do it. So, so with that, I want to end on that wonderful quote that you said, the Benjamin Franklin quote, nothing to excess, including moderation. I think that's really wise advice for us as clinicians too. You know, I'm reminded of a patient, I had a patient with schizophrenia who said to me, whatever you do, don't get rid of the voices. They're my friends. Just make them nice. Mm -hmm. And I realized, <laughs> right? And I realized if my goal is to abolish a symptom, I may be doing harm to my patient. It may be really about harm reduction or moderation, right? Yes. Yes, certainly true. It's called, you know, listening to your patients and basically cultivating a uh, bespoke, tailored, mm. you know, personally designed, personalized treatment plan. That sounds like very wise advice. And I hope that everybody has enjoyed our conversation. Uh, Steve, we're going to wrap it up for now, but we have a couple more episodes coming up in this, this theme that we're talking about, examining creativity and bipolar disorder. We're hopefully going to be speaking a little more about Nikola Tesla. And please tune in again for our uh, further podcasts in this series of the Psychopharmacology Show. And please check out all of the other NEI podcasts. And you can find us on any place where you get your podcasts. And you can also go to our website, www.neiglobal.com, for more information. Steve, thanks so much. It's been terrific. Yeah, thank you, Andy. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the NEI podcast. Please let us know what you'd like to hear more about by leaving a review. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe today.